Om Shanti. Good evening and um, welcome to this evening's program that is being hosted by the Wembley Inner Space. My name is uh, Pratiba and I'm from South Africa in Johannesburg. I have been a student of the Brahma Kumaris for now about 30 years. Um, born and brought up in South Africa, it was an interesting time because we were at the height of apartheid in those years. And so meditation and particularly the teachings of the Brahma Kumaris played a, a fundamental role for me in terms of navigating through a very critical, uncertain, unstable time um, until 94 when, when apartheid was dismantled and a new beginning began in the country which impacted our personal lives a great deal. So these many years of studying uh, with the Brahma Kumaris has been very important and also shaped in terms of the work that we do in the country, but also in terms of the healing and the coming together of people of all cultures and all backgrounds. So it's really a lovely opportunity this evening to share with you all some of my, my insights along the journey. Um, this evening, the topic that I was asked to speak on is very appropriate, uh, replacing outdated beliefs. Um, I think we can all identify the role that beliefs play. And uh, particularly in terms of the history that I lived through, in terms of being in this country, we can see that how certain beliefs can be so detrimental, not just to an individual, but to an entire community, an entire society, an entire country in a way. So undoing uh, some of these beliefs are so important and fundamental. When I thought about uh, replacing outdated beliefs, I you know, was thinking that actually, I think all beliefs are outdated in some ways, because I began to explore in a way that there's a difference between belief and, and knowing something in, internally. You know, beliefs are, are often things that we embrace as a, a reality or as a truth um, based on outside influences, maybe things that we've been told, things that we've been conditioned to um, identify with because of our environment or um, things that um, we've had experiences of uh, that begins to define a particular picture of our world and of ourselves and how we perceive reality. So in some ways, in my journey, I found that it's very critical to, uh, you know, to pause uh, um, from time to time and to actually explore my, my beliefs because they shape me. Uh, you know, beliefs are, are powerful and they, they create sort of a boundary within which I work and I live in and which I allow myself to have an experience of. So from time to time, it's very critical and, and important to, to step back and say, what am I believing and why is it this? And how does it function? And does it still hold? And is it still relevant? Uh, does it still make sense in, in the context I'm in now? Because things do change. And, and when I begin to explore my beliefs in that way, then I begin to feel as well that then it also helps me to see that uh, what are the principles by which I define my life. And I think that's the distinction that I have explored in my journey. And that is really to begin to see what beliefs are and what are my principles. And, and to me, when I begin to uncover these principles for myself, then they become the pegs in the ground. 
uh, they become sort of uh, the, the needle that, that aligns my internal compass uh, because they remain more fixed. Uh, with beliefs, I tend to feel that I need to relook at them and um, and to refine them and to undo them many a times and sometimes to also reaffirm things that needs to be reaffirmed. Um, I want to begin with a little story and I'm going to share a little picture here. Um, simple little slide. Um, and it's a fishbowl. Some of you may have a fishbowl at home. Um, and, you know, many a times as we watch the fishes in the tank or the fishbowl, um, it does give us a sense of calm and peace. But um, it's uh, the story I want to share relates to a friend of mine. Uh, she had one of these little go fish in a bowl. And um, so she had to clean the bowl. Um, and so one day she she takes the fish and um, we we used to have a swimming pool at that stage. So she took the fish and she uh, put it into the swimming pool. And I thought, what a crazy thing to do now. Um, but something very interesting happened. This little fish that spent most of its life in this little bowl, um, spent all its time swimming in a little circle, right? And the next moment she put it in the swimming pool and now it was like an ocean for this little fish to explore. But do you know what happened? The fish continued to swim in that little circle. It was almost like it couldn't distinguish that um, its environment had changed. It's no longer in a little bowl, but it's in a bigger ocean and there's more to explore and more to experience. And for me, that is what beliefs are. Because at a certain point, we have a particular experience. Um, and that experience in some ways is, is right, it's true, um, it's relevant, it has an impact on us. Um, so inevitably what happens is when we have an experience is that we create then a boundary uh, in our mind. And, and that boundary is what I call a belief uh, because that one experience sort of defines a kind of a, a truth for me in a way. And the amazing thing is that uh, context change, environments change, people change, situations change, but so often we continue within that boundary. Like that little goldfish swimming in that little circle, it continues to swim in that circle. So we continue to operate in this little boundary. Uh, meanwhile, everything has changed and there are new experiences waiting for us. There are new lessons to be learned out there, um, new things to discover, but this mental limit that I put on myself that keeps me going in this small circle. So I thought that was a powerful image in a way that we can begin to see the impact that uh, beliefs do have on us and how important it is to re-examine them again and again, to see that, do they still hold? Do they have relevance? Are they still important? Um, there's a very interesting and well-researched um, cell biologist called Bruce Lipton. And he says um, in his book, The Biology of Belief, that you know over 90% of the time, we like living an old reality. <laughs> it's like we're living a set of beliefs that we created. And, and he talks about it in a sense that we like a sleep uh, because we're living in, a, you know, in the boundary of what we've picked up um, through a previous experience and how we allow that experience to keep defining it. 
uh, to keep defining our present reality. So coming back to this whole thing that, you know, really taking that time out, um, seeking that opportunity to step back and and really look at things um, so that I can begin to explore, um, are they still relevant? Do they still hold? And shouldn't I let go? And, and many times this question of, of letting go and unlearning is, is, is quite a journey uh, because many times I found that we can mentally tell ourselves, yeah, it's, it's superstition, it's just an old idea that I have or whatever. But, you know, beliefs also have a very strong emotional connection. So I often found that I can I can tell myself logically, mentally, this is what is, this is what isn't, but it's like that emotion still holds, and and so you would tend to find that you would still uh, be very cautious and confine yourself to your belief because of the emotion that is there within. Um, I often like challenging people and asking them, how many of you cut your nails at night? And very few people will say, no, no, I don't. I only do it during the day. And it's an old wives tale. It's an old superstition that you should not cut your nails at night because it brings bad luck, right? <laughs> and, and so we know it's superstition. We know there's nothing like that. It, it's, it's, um, it's a question of hygiene, a question that in the light you can see things uh, better. So uh, whatever the case may be. Um, but yet as much as there is the logic, yet the emotional hook is something that takes a lot more to let go of. So one of the things that I often found that is very important is that we can only let go of our old beliefs when we take a risk. We take a risk to actually give ourselves a chance to experience something new and something different. Because when we experience something, then that experience sort of almost rewires that reality for us. It, it creates a, a, a break in that boundary of belief. Um, that's what a new experience does. It helps me to redefine the reality. And there was a very, um, lovely saying that I came across, which I'd like to just share with you that a day came when the risk to remain tight in a bud was more painful than the risk it took to blossom. And this is um, a saying by Anais Nin. And I liked it because in a way, many times, the beliefs that we adopt give us the false security of feeling safe. It's like, you know, I know and I've been there and it's like, um, so, so it gives me this false, false kind of safe feeling. But I don't grow if I stay within that. If I remain as a bud with, with, just be covered up all the time. Yeah, I may remain safe, but um, you know, it eventually results in where um, there's a need in me to grow and to discover. Otherwise life becomes very stale and ordinary and, um, and dull in a way, if it just becomes a routine because I'm too afraid to do something new. I'm too afraid to venture out beyond what is the known. Um, and so it, it begins to create a kind of discontent inside because I'm not moving my internal energy, my internal thinking. I'm not feeling I'm growing. I'm not feeling I'm discovering new things. And so that's what creates a kind of a suffocation for the self. And, and sometimes it's only when, when that happens, then we are sort of inspired to, to let go and release. Um, 
for me, it's always been a good guideline in one way to say that, um, do I want to remain comfortable or do I want to experience freedom? And if I want to be comfortable and stay in my comfort zone, well, then I stay within this, this belief system, uh, which gives me that idea that I know what is there and sort of in some ways like a sense of control that I have. Um, but I value freedom more. And if I value freedom more, then I know I have to take that step out into the unknown, into the unfamiliar, into that which um, my consciousness, my, my sense of being wants to, to realize and experience and, and rediscover. So just beginning to see, you know, the contrast between um, the two aspects of, of why why it's necessary, why it's useful, why it's so important that we begin to undo um, our belief systems and re-examine them, re-examine them to see that, do they hold relevance? Um, um, do they allow me to still learn? Because if they don't allow me to learn and to grow, then I know it's time to move on. Um, I have another little slide now that I'd like to show. And um, it's also another little story. Um, one day there was a, um, an eagle egg that it somehow managed to roll off from the nest and ended up in a farmyard. And so the hen thought it was one of her eggs. So she took it and she took care of it, kept it with the other eggs. And so what happens is that this little eagle uh, egg eventually hatches and a little chick emerges out. And for that little chick, um, although it was an eagle, but it grew up thinking of it, of itself as a little hen's chick. And so she would do what the other chicks would do, peck around the yard, picking up worms, picking up seeds and running around. And, and that was life. And it was safe and it was fine. It was quite comfortable. And uh, one day what happens to this eagle chick as she grows a little older, maybe she's about um, a few months older, she one day looks up into the sky. And when she looks up into the sky, she sees this glorious bird gliding in the sky, um, so majestic and so powerful. And, um, and she thinks to herself, oh, how I wish I was that bird. So it's a very powerful story in some ways. And it leads me to the next aspect that I want to take up. Because one of the key areas that we need to look at, and that is the beliefs that we hold of ourselves. Um, the question that comes up is that, the way we see ourselves results in the way we talk to ourselves and the way we talk to ourselves results in how it shapes us, how we relate to our world, how we um, value ourselves and value everything, how we give priority to things. So self-identity is so key. It's so key in terms of how I um, engage with my world because my self identity becomes like a filter through which I look at the world. And um, a lot of us, when we think of ourselves and how we define ourselves, um, we tend to see ourselves based on how we condition to see ourselves. And so that conditioning could be um, I think first and primary is our family. 
you know, um, if I'm the first child in the family, then there's a certain particular expectation and result of me. If I'm the youngest in the family, it's a, another kind of expectation and result. Um, so our family also tends to tell us things when we are children, which we internalize as that's who we are and that's what we are. So our family, our religion gives us a particular identity of how we see ourselves, um, but also the way we see ourselves then also becomes the lens in terms of how I relate to the other. So how we tended to create um, dividing lines between us because we perhaps came from different faiths. Um, our nationality, uh, you know, uh, if I'm a particular nationality, then, you know, I'm maybe hardworking, I'm seen as hardworking, or I'm seen as being very thrifty, or I'm seen as being very creative or whatever. So one is how we see ourselves based on all these elements, but also how society conditions us into the way we see ourselves. And so often then we operate within those limits, those conditioned identities that we pick up. And so it's a bit like, like that little chick uh, who in reality is an eagle, but who tended to see herself as a little chick, a hen's chick and was conditioned and was told that that's who you are. And so if that's who you are, that's what you do. Um, but that's not what she is. And so something begins to spark in her. And so this whole aspect that, you know, we are more than our religion, um, our race, um, you know, in South Africa, uh, so many crimes um, had been committed on the basis of that. Uh, you know, everything was categorized. Um, you were brought up to believe and conditioned to think that if you're white, then you have certain entitlements. You are superior in some ways. You're more intelligent. You're more beautiful. Uh, you're more successful. Um, and if you're black, then you're not clever. You're stupid. You um, you cannot be. Uh, you know, capable of doing things, etc. And so we know those things are not true. And, and that's why to undo that conditioning is so important to begin to realize that we more than the stories we are told to believe we are. We are more than the stories we have told ourselves we are. And furthermore, we are even more than the stories um, based on our experiences. So one important belief to undo uh, for all of us is the belief that I am a body. Because when I think of myself a body, then my, my identity becomes based on the context of my body. And that is, as I've mentioned, race, religion, culture, nationality, um, my education, my profession, um, how I see myself on this on the social status, etc. So all of those things uh, provides a context of where I find myself in, but it doesn't tell me who I really am. And so to really undo that first false belief and to begin to rediscover, who I truly am. So one of the aspects that um, I would like to just take you into is really introducing this awareness that, you know, all these physical aspects that I've spoken about, race and gender, religion, appearance, culture, et cetera, things that society measures me by, and to some extent that I have measured myself by are sort of the secondary aspects of myself. They're not 
the primary, the true essence of who I am. And so we introduce in the Brahma Kumari's teaching a very powerful, important concept. And that is that the self is an subtle energy of consciousness. Uh, the self is pure energy. And that the original nature, the core of my being are these very powerful qualities of peace, truth, power, purity, joy, love. That that is the original core of myself. And, and these internal qualities that I am uh, defines my true nature. Um, and when I connect with these, then what it does is that it then begins to give expression into the context I find myself in. So how I apply myself in terms of in my relationships, in the work that I do, in the specialities and talents that I show, in the values that I hold that, that guide me, that, um, uh, you know, um, helps me to make my choices, etc. In the personality that I develop, it's this inner core that I begin to give expression to. So this whole process that coming back to this understanding of who I am is a process of really beginning to live from the inside out. What we have done for, for decades is that we've lived from the outside in. We let our position, our roles, our professions, our story, our religion, our appearance, etc., define who we were. Uh, and so we let the external uh, dictate what we became within and how we saw ourselves within and how we related to ourselves within. And the problem with the external is that it's always subjected to change. Um, you know, it's like an environment that changes, like that real little goldfish that from living in a little bowl, she was next in a swimming pool. So the whole context changed. But because I let the external define me, um, I, I become locked in terms of how I see myself. And so therefore, it can also, that kind of change that we find ourselves in, then unsettles us a lot. And, and because things that I could use as a, as a boundary no longer exists. And so it creates stress, it creates the uncertainty, it creates the, um, the feeling of, of not being able to cope. Um, and therefore, what we begin to learn to do and learn to um, undo in a way, some, in some ways, is that as I begin to reconnect with myself as this eternal being, and, and so for me, you know, when I started off, that there are certain principles which are like the pegs in the ground. And that is what it is in, in some ways that I, this eternal being, that my truth is that I am peace, that I am love, that I am joy, that I am purity, I am power. That this, this is what I am. And that's the peg in the ground for me. Um, because no matter how my environment changes, uh, no matter what challenges come my way, it's like what I define for me as my value is that innate self. Uh, once there was a very lovely um, example that was used, uh, a man in a, he was holding a conference. So uh, while he was presenting, he took out a hundred dollar bill and he asked who would like to have this hundred dollar bill. And of course, many people raised their hands and said, yes, I would. And then he squashed it and said, who would still like to have this hundred dollar bill? And people still raised their hands, of course, that still want it. And then he stomped it on the ground and, you know, 
really bashed it about. <laughs> and then he asked, who would like this $100 bill? And yet people still said, I would like it. It doesn't matter. So it's like, no matter how the environment changes, no matter what the story is that that $100 bill went through, but what is its innate value remains still. That doesn't go. And so therefore, when I begin to see myself as the soul, as this consciousness, um, whose true qualities is peace, love, purity, joy, truth, and power, then in a way that no matter how my external environment shifts and changes, I still remain intact. Because what I am is not defined by my external. And in some ways, it's that I, I give to my external what I am from within, rather than letting the external define me for who I am in that sense. Um, it reminds me of uh, a story, actually, of a young girl that shared. It was during the sustainable, um, it was the COP conference that we held in Durban um, a good few years back. And they had a, a session where young people were sharing their stories. And, um, um, you know, it was just shortly after the Arab Spring that this conference had taken place. And so there was this young uh, Egyptian girl that was sharing that, you know, from childhood, um, she always struggled with breathing because her lungs were quite affected by the pollution. So that in itself had encouraged her and motivated her to play quite a fundamental role in, in the climate change and climate activism in a way. And she shared how with the Arab Spring that a lot of the climate work came to a halt, but um, the whole change over that occurred and, and how people came into the streets and, 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 and suddenly it was like, um, there was a whole shift in things. And of course, there was a shift in governance, et, et cetera, as well. But she said that how in her neighborhood, um, after the marches had left and everything, of course, the streets were very dirty. And so one old woman, you know, went out and started sweeping up and cleaning and seeing how many people got out into the street and started cleaning uh, the streets, etc. And um, there was one woman um, who was asked, why is she doing this? And she said, you know, uh, there was just the feeling that, um, you know, that this is now ours. And she said, by profession or her work in a way was that she used to clean the streets, but she did it as a job, as a way of survival but now she was doing it with pride in a way to say that um, she felt that this was something that they recreated together in a way, a new beginning, a new way of being. So her closing statement left a deep impression on me. She says, we are bigger and greater than what we are told to believe we are. We are more powerful than what we are told to think of ourselves as. And so that's the whole element in a way to begin to recognize and see. And that really is that how when we begin to um, explore ourselves within and, and reconnect with our true essence, you know, what we are within, never mind the histories, never mind the past, but that at our core, we are a spiritual energy and that we're powerful in who we are and what we are. And so that's the first thing that we need to undo. And that's, and that's a lifelong journey because I find that there's so many layers of this kind of um, belief that we ended up internalizing of how we see ourselves. And when we, when we begin to explore and, and really begin to, in some ways, practice to see ourselves more than this, this limited identity, what it begins to do is that it allows me, it gives me permission to experience something deeper and greater. You know, um, 
one of the feelings is really just when we go beyond the limitations of our skin, when we go beyond the limitations of our religion, we connect then with each other. So one is how it helps me to see myself in a different way, but that also begins to become the filter in how I see the other, that I can see the other as also a soul, a consciousness who has this incredible potential and beauty to be loving, to be kind, to be gentle, to be, to be powerful in that way. And so we connect with each other, we begin to relate to each other in a different way. Because our limited belief of ourselves also influences the beliefs we begin to hold of other people. As much as we put ourselves in a box, we also put others in a box in a way. And only if I release myself from my own little box and see myself as, as this divine you know, soul, as this being of consciousness, as a child of God, then it gives me permission, it gives me capacity, it gives me a, an ability almost in a way to relate differently, to connect differently, and to experience differently. So this first aspect of really coming back to really recognizing and seeing who I am and what I am, and that, you know, let me, let me challenge those beliefs I've held of myself and to see myself as a divine spark of consciousness, as a creative divine being that has infinite potential. Um, and, and the more that I begin to remind myself of that, the more I can begin to um, experience things differently. The second belief that I think is so important to also undo for ourselves, and in some ways it is related to this belief of identity as well. And that's the belief that we hold that um, other people are responsible for the way I feel. And, um, you know, so often when we are having difficulty in relationships, etc., we tend to tell, you make me angry, you make me unhappy, you make me um, sad, etc. cetera. Um, and, you know, as long as we make others responsible for the way we feel, uh, we give our power away to other people. And so if we want to reclaim our power, um, if we want to reclaim ourselves in a way, then we need to undo this one deep belief. And that is that others are responsible for the way I feel. And to, you know, undo that, to begin to remind myself and tell myself that, you know, I am accountable for the way I feel. And it's not always an easy thing to accept. Because, you know, we've had some difficult challenges. People don't always behave the way they expected to or what's expected, etc. cetera. Um, we have um, had experiences that have left impressions on us of, of pain and of sorrow. We perhaps may have been humiliated or there may have been some kind of trauma experience. And, and sometimes it's, it's not even my personal experience, but it's maybe the experience of my family that eventually comes to me as well, that I inherit um, as, a, as, as a memory that gets passed on. So, so we, we tend to define ourselves by these experiences. And, and, and therefore we feel justified in thinking that the way we feel is as a result of but when I begin to learn and work on this awareness that I'm a soul and that I'm consciousness, what it does that I begin to understand that within consciousness is where I create my thoughts. And everything that I experience in life and everything that I go through in life in a way 
uh, really depends on how I think about it. You agree with me there? You know, um, classic example, it could be either a half full glass or a half empty glass, right? And we know, depending on how I think about it, either as half filled, that I have some attainment, or half empty, I'm thinking of it in terms of loss, depending on how I think is going to result in the way I feel. And until I take accountability that this feeling is because of how I'm interpreting what is happening around me um, and what is happening to me as well, uh, that as long as I choose to uh, interpret it in a particular way, that is how I'm going to feel. And so a big, you know, sort of undoing of this belief uh, begins by really taking moments in my day. And when I take these moments in my day, I pause. I pause and I become quiet and I just become... Um, you know, return to my center of peace. And when I do that, it's almost like I'm putting a full stop to the train of thoughts and feelings that was running in my mind for, for you know, up until this moment in time. So when I take that moment of pause and then I look um, and it's it's almost like I come back to center, I come back to recalibrating my internal compass. Um, and then I can begin to observe my thoughts. So the pause is necessary so that it gives me the next step of beginning to observe my thinking. And when I observe my thinking, um, then it gives me an opportunity, an opportunity to become aware of the quality of my thoughts. Because most times we think without realizing what we're thinking. <laughs> um, it's just an automatic train that, that runs in our head, uh, an automatic record that keeps playing within ourselves. So this thing of pausing for a moment and just coming back to quietness, coming back to stillness, coming back to like a clean space in me. And then let me observe my thoughts. And, and as I observe my thoughts in that moment, then it gives me the opportunity that, are these thoughts serving me? Or are these thoughts based on an old pattern? Are these thoughts creating something new and fresh and supporting me? Or are these thoughts taking me into a downward spiral? So the observation makes me aware of the quality of my thoughts. And then based on the quality of my thoughts, I make a choice. And so this whole process of creating this practice of pausing and learning to observe my thinking and becoming more aware of it, of it is what actually empowers me. Because when I live a life, when I'm uh, decisions based on choices and not just habit and not just reacting to things around me, but it's a conscious, well-considered choice that I'm making, then it's like in a quiet way, I'm reclaiming my power. I'm reclaiming myself. I am becoming uh, and returning to my own wholeness and my own fullness in that way. Um, so this is also a very, very important belief. And, and we slip into it very easily to think that you make me feel, but no one makes me feel. No one's responsible for the way I feel. My feelings are my creation. And when I take that accountability and when I reclaim that, then I create a new way of being and I give myself new opportunity of, of accessing in myself a capacity that I wouldn't have thought I would I have. You know, it's, it's like when I'm working from habit, I'm working in one track. There's a lovely saying that goes that if you always do 
what you always did, you will always get what you always got. And so when I find that my life is in one routine circle, then to know that it's because I'm thinking in a particular pattern and therefore I'm reacting in that pattern. And as I react in that pattern, I will get from it what I always got before. So it's about just undoing and relearning and rethinking about myself in that way. Um, so that's the second belief that is that is very, very important. And, and then the third belief that I think it's useful to challenge ourselves by and to undo, and that is to feel happiness lies outside of me. It's only when I get that good job or that big salary or go on that holiday or that right relationship. So, uh, you know, the belief that happiness lies outside of me, it's dependent on things outside of me. And even love depends on how, on, on someone else loving me. And these two believes in a way of, of thinking that my well-being is based on things outside of me uh, is, a, you know, continuously puts us in this trap of, of needing to, to keep um, chasing after, chasing after that elusive thing called happiness in a way, chasing after um, that relationship that I think is going to give me the fulfillment that I'm seeking for. So a very deep and important realization and recognition is really that the soul has within it um, the capacity to be completely joyful. The soul is love. The soul is bliss. And, and so what is the process then? So in the teaching of meditation with the Brahma Kumaris, uh, the whole aim is that let me activate who I truly am. When I realize I'm that soul, that inner being, whose true qualities are love, peace, purity, and goodness, then the process of meditation is really that I return to that true essence of who I am. I'm returning to that um, deeper reality of who I am. Um, so as I use my thoughts to give focus on those inner qualities that I see myself as, it activates that energy within me. It, it awakens it within me so that it's not just a quality or an idea, but it becomes a power within me that I begin to activate. And so in, in summary, um, that's our journey, you know? Our journey is about returning to that true self that we are. Not the self that we've believed we are, not the self we were told we need to think of ourselves as, but who we are, that authentic self, that self that was divinely created, that self whose inheritance is of love, peace, purity, and bliss. And so meditation is in one way going within, reconnecting with that inner part of my being, but in that process also that knowing that I, as this inner being, um, I am a child of God. And so as I connect my mind to God as well, that I draw that pure energy that enables me to empower, to activate, to revive, to reawaken um, the sacred within myself. And so it's a beautiful journey of self-discovery. And, um, and yes, I think our journey is about recognizing outdated beliefs and letting them go. Um, just challenging ourselves to see a deeper and greater reality. So I hope some of these ideas have been useful and something that you can work with and experiment with in your own lives. And I would now like to take you into um, a short meditation because for me, that's, 
the heart of the practice. And it is through this practice that it, it unfolds, allows that, that bud to blossom and be that beautiful rose that it is meant to be. So for the meditation, I'm going to ask you to just take a moment and just try and sit up straight wherever you may be. Rest your feet on the ground. Um, and if you would like, you can either keep your eyes closed or if you look behind me, um, you would see a little frame or I'll put up a slide now, um, which you could just focus on. And it is the slide of just uh, um, a point of consciousness. And so you could either rest your eyes on that or close your eyes, whatever you feel comfortable. And just taking a deep breath. And as you're breathing in, just taking that awareness of newness and lightness and freshness. And as you're breathing out, just let go, just let go any kind of tightness that you may be feeling. Um, and just allow yourself in this moment to become really comfortable with yourself. Just relax. Be aware of, of the floor beneath your feet and be aware of how the earth is supporting you. Feel your body completely sinking into the chair or the couch, whatever you're sitting on. And just release any kind of tension. Feel the air on your skin, warm, comfortable feeling. And feel your breath as you're breathing in and out. Just observe your natural rhythm of breath as you're breathing in and out. Sense that kind of a harmony between your body and your environment in this moment. And when we allow the body to relax, we begin to feel a quietness growing within our being. Just sense that quietness and just allow yourself to almost like go deeper into that quietness, go deeper into that softness of your inner being. And I'm just going to introduce you to the idea that, that there's an energy within your body which is different from the energy of your body, of matter. It's a subtle energy. For a moment, just sense that, you know, beneath the skin, behind the eyes, is the subtle energy consciousness. And this consciousness is the life force within this body. And as you become more aware, I want you to just visualize that energy of consciousness as a point of light, as a point seated silently and comfortably behind the eyes, the seat of the soul. As you allow yourself just to return to that place of soul consciousness, just experience that deep stillness of being. Recognize that I, the soul, I am eternal. I the soul, I am peace. And so return to that place of peace in your own being. 
and just experience that peace filtering from the room of your consciousness into every cell in your body. Just feel and in this moment be aware that the energy I am is the energy that I radiate outwards. I am peace and I emit peace. I create a world of peace based on what I'm being. And in this moment, I rest my awareness on just being peace. And in silence, just hold that energy for a few moments and feel that energy of your consciousness and just be still. And when you feel ready, just bring your awareness back to the present. And just allow that feeling of peace and stillness to filter through you. And just to allow that peace and stillness to radiate outwards and create an environment of peace and stillness for you. Reminding you that I am based on how I choose to think about myself. I'm a soul, I'm sacred, I'm light, I'm peace. Thank you. So thank you for being part of this evening's experience.